So, uh, Vignesh, you can still hear me, correct? Yes, you sound loud and clear now. Perfect. So today we're going to be covering link building. It's something that a lot of marketers hate, but think of it as a positive thing. Because if most people hate it, you know they're not going to do it. And if they don't do it, they're way less likely to build links. And if they don't build links, that means it's easier to outrank your competition. No matter how useful right, your content may be, if you don't have links, you won't rank high organically. You need links to rank. Without the links, I haven't seen very many sites rank high unless they have brand queries, which we'll get onto in the upcoming weeks. But the point I'm trying to make is uh, links are one of the biggest factors of Google's algorithm. So we are in week five. And this week, we're going to be breaking down everything from the tactics I use for link building to the templates to even a link building scorecard to how you need to look at links to even how all links are not equal and how you can beat your competitions with less links. The cool part about link building is, and SEO in general, I don't see it changing anytime soon, in which the more links you get, you should continually rank higher in the long run. Why, you may ask? Well, it's one of the hardest factors to manipulate. And for that reason, it's going to be really, really tough for Google to be like, hey, we're not going to count links when it comes to SEO rankings. Well, if you don't count links, all the other signals are much more easy to replicate and manipulate. The other thing that you need to know about SEO is most of Google's income is purely based off of AdWords, right? 88%. Microsoft income, a lot of it, although not all of it, but a decent portion, is also based on ads. Now, here's the crazy part. Think about Google for a second. You use Google because of the organic listings. Ads came later. When Google first came out, it was a search engine. Eventually, years later, they put ads. And that's the whole concept, right? People use Google for the organic listings to look up information. And eventually, some of those people click on ads. That just shows that organic traffic is there to stay. If Google just had a page full of ads and nothing else, people would stop using Google tomorrow and they'd probably go to B. Same with Facebook. Now, Facebook's a bit more aggressive, but you know, a lot of people go to Facebook for images, see what their friends are doing, status updates. Uh, Facebook has been pushing ads more heavily over the last whew, year and a half, two years. And you can tell because their algorithms have become way more strict on what gets shown on your fan page or your page when it comes to other people sharing and liking it. But again, right, if you look at these companies, the Facebooks, the Googles of the world, they originally built their platform not for ads. They built it for a specific use case, finding information, connecting with your friends. The ads is a secondary benefit for them in which they create an amazing product or service they can now monetize. Now Google did a study, most people don't know about this, and they were discussing you know different SERPs listings and they decided to put an um, ad spot on these SERP listings that didn't really have many right when they're doing this test. Can you guess what happened to the organic traffic when they put in these ad listings? It stayed the same and when they removed them right? Yeah, sure, people would click on more organic listings over time, but at the beginning what they ended up finding out was if 100 people clicked on the organic listings, when they put the ad spots, it stayed the same. Mm -hmm. And over time as new people search, yeah, sure, maybe a percent of them clicked on the paid listings, but they quickly learned that, hey, pay doesn't cannibalize organic and vice versa. The people who click on organic tend to be organic the people who click on pay tend to be paid. And what that means is think of it this way. When I say, hey, when Google did this study and they found that when someone did a search and they added the paid, it stayed the same, that means, sure, yes, the amount of people that click stayed the same on organic, but just because there's 100 clicks doesn't mean there's 100 searches. It could be that 150 people did a Google search query and 100 clicked on the organic listings and 50 didn't click on anything, right? But when you add in paid, some of those 50 people started clicking on the paid results. That just shows that organic is here to stay, it's strong, and you need to be in there. 
I'm not saying you shouldn't do pay per click, but okay. there's benefits of doing SEO and pay per click. And here's just the main difference, right? Conductor did a study. They found that when you're doing organic, that there's higher trust value, right? You know people aren't paying for it. And because people aren't paying for it, you're much more likely to take the listing more serious and you're more likely to convert, right? Now with pay-per-click, your conversion rates may be extremely high, but you have to keep in mind you can pick your landing page and that's why pay-per-click conversion rates tend to be higher. As for organic, it's evergreen. You can keep getting the traffic forever and ever. It is the majority of the traffic share. The click-through rates are way higher. And yes, it does take longer to rank organically, but it is worth it in the long run. So in summary, these big social properties and search engines, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, even has search, they need your content. They want more content to rank organically because that's going to mean more people are going to end up using them. If more people end up using them, then that means they'll make more ad revenue. In other words, they're relying on you to be successful. And advertising doesn't replace organic. It complements it, as we saw from that Google study, right? And what you need to really focus on is not just doing paid, but you also need to do organic. And I'm not saying you should do organic and ignore paid. Ideally, if paid makes sense for your business, you probably should be doing both. I also want to go over a quick case study. This is Credit Karma. You guys have probably heard about them. They do over $500 million a year in revenue. That's a crazy number, right? They're in a super competitive space. They're talking about credit cards and finances and mortgages. They've been publishing a ton of content, roughly three articles a day for many, many years. Here's the crazy part. A large portion of their traffic comes from organic, right? It's depending on how you want to slice and dice it. Um, but when you add it up, a lot of organic or a lot of direct is also organic, so you're probably looking at over 30%. Um, if you look at your Google Analytics, you'll notice that the higher your organic goes, the higher your direct traffic will go. The lower your organic goes, the lower your direct traffic will be. Right? They go hand in hand. A lot of direct traffic is uh, search traffic. The point I'm trying to make is it's very valuable. You could assume that $150 million a year of their revenue comes from SEO and content marketing, which go hand in hand. That's huge. You're making a big mistake if you don't try to leverage SEO and content marketing. If you look at Credit Karma, what's driving their growth? It's steady link building. Over time, they've been getting more and more links. Their traffic flows as their link grows. The more links they get, the more their traffic is growing. They've built over 368,000 backlinks over time, and that's why they're just crushing it. You can create all the content you want in the world, but if Credit Karma never had the links, they wouldn't rank. Link building is super powerful. You can't ignore it. It's one of the key components of SEO. It is a factor that affects SEO in your rankings more than any other factor out there. So if you're not familiar with link building, I know this is basic and most of you guys are probably familiar with this. I'll get into more advanced stuff later on. But link building is about acquiring new inbound links to your website from other websites. In other words, link building isn't you linking to your own page from another page on your website. It's about, let's say, me, neilpatel.com, linking to your website. It's a proven tactic to also increase brand awareness and referral traffic. Because the more other websites linking to you, you also get clicks from those links, which drive up your referral traffic. Now, Moz did a study where they asked 150 experts what they think affects rankings more than anything else. The top two factors that they stated were link-related factors. The first one was domain-level links, and the second was page-level links, which is the same thing. In other words, what site is linking to you, and then the second one would be what page on that site is linking to you. But everyone, it's not just me, is saying that link building is where it's at. And if you're not sure what link building really is or how it works, think of it as votes. If there was a presidential election or any sort of government election, typically the candidate with the most votes wins. The same goes with the web. The more people that link to you, 
a link being a vote, the better off you are. Now, you also have to keep in mind all links aren't equal. If, you know, um, I don't know, a celebrity votes for you, it typically has more weight than if I vote for you, right? Because everyone loves celebrities. Another thing is relevancy. If a celebrity who's in your space or a politician votes for you and you're a politician, it's more effective than Neil, a marketer, you know, voting for you. Same goes with Google. If you have a marketing business and a marketer links to you, that's much more effective than if a financial website links to you. Now, here's an example of Microsoft. Here's their search traffic. As you can see, it's declining over time. This just shows, and they're still getting a ton of organic traffic, but the point I'm trying to make is this just shows you can't just stop link building. Microsoft has tons of links. But if you don't keep link building over time, your rankings will end up dropping. You got to keep building new links or looking at freshness as well. And another huge component is Hummingbird. And this changed up the link building game drastically in which before it used to be whoever had the most links won. Now it's whoever has the most links combined with awesome content wins. And this is why we did content marketing over the last few weeks, right? So here's an example of the personal finance space. Here's GetRichSlowly.org and the Penny Hoarder. Penny Hoarder has a lot less links, less than half. Who do you think has more traffic? Well, if you look at the stats, Get Rich Slowly is actually doing quite well. 209,000 visitors a month from Google. Penny Hoarder is getting 348. How could that be? Half the links, more search traffic? They must be doing something, right? Well, they are. The reason they're doing better is because of their content. So this here shows topical relevance. And topical relevance is how in-depth did someone go on that topic? And if you look at the penny hoarder, right, they got an overall 68%. If you look at Get Rich Slowly, they're at 50%. This just shows Get Rich Slowly is writing thin content. They're not really covering all aspects of personal finance. Their blog post may be a thousand words instead of two or three thousand words. They may be keyword stuffing instead of helping or using LSI. The point I'm trying to make is you have to be thorough with your content. Building links isn't enough. It's a combination of content marketing with link building. And that's why thoroughness is super important and that's why we cover content marketing. So if you look at the power of each link that Penny Hoarder is getting is each link roughly carries 27 times more ranking power than Get Rich Slowly. Because you're looking at how many pages of content they have, how many backlinks, and if you look at it, Penny Hoarder is doing 27 times better for, the, for how much content they're producing. It's kind of crazy, right? So let's take a moment and review everything that we just covered. You already know how to find the right keywords and topics, which we covered in previous weeks. You know the factors that matter for Google and how you can do better in offline SEO. We've talked about your musketeer in creating supercharged content. We've talked about how to create intent. We've even showed you how to promote the content, right? We went over that, and that's kind of fun. I love that part. You already know a lot of the tools you can be using. And in essence, if you start combining all of this with link building, you can do quite well, right? The key is after you got the basics down, you got to start going out there and finding quality backlinks. So the tools you can use to find quality backlinks are Ahrefs, BuzzSumo, and then I like using Mailshake. For some reason, I always call it Milkshake, but I like using Mailshake for outreach as well. There's one thing that you have in your portal. It's called the link building scorecard. And this link building scorecard will help you break down if a link is good, if it's bad, if it's worth it, if you shouldn't be following up with it, or anything like that, right? And this is great because now you know if a link is good or not. Now, let's go over what makes a good link based on what you have in your scorecard. So the first one is referring domains. You ideally want new referring domains to continue to link to you. You don't want the same domain over and over to link to you. It diminishes. But if you keep getting new links, you're going to be much better off. It's just a question of time. You also want to do follow links, right? 
And what I mean by that is you want other people to link to you with do follow. Do follow is, hey, this passes juice. No follow is, hey, this link doesn't help with rankings. You want do follow links. A do follow is telling a search engine, hey, this link helps. It counts. When you link out to people and you no follow them, search engines are like, oh, this link doesn't count. You want do follow links. And there's a plugin if you're using Chrome called No Follow. It'll point out when a link is no followed versus do follow. That'll help you quickly identify them. You can also build links, not just from any site, but sites with traffic. So when I go to Ahrefs and I'm looking at building links, I try to get links from pages that have traffic. These are much more effective than links that don't have traffic. You want to look at domain and page authority as well. Ahrefs talks about URL authority, domain rating, right, whatever they want to call it. Moz has their version. Majestic has their version. But the way you want to look at it is the stronger the URL and stronger the domain, the better off you are. Think of it as a logarithmic scale, so the higher the better. Anchor text is also very important. Do a portion of your anchor text have the brand keyword in there? That's extremely important. They shouldn't all have the keyword. Do they also include the keyword? or variations of it, or other terms related to that keyword, right? Are some of your links just containing the URL, or are they just generic, like click here? And in general, you, right, you want a mixture of everything. You just don't want keywords linking to you. That's what makes it natural. The more natural, the better off your rankings are going to be. So when you're trying to build links, you also have to look at the anchor text. If the anchor text all is your term for your domain, then you're not going to rank for any keywords, right? And you can see this in Ahrefs. Or if it's all keywords, that's bad as well. But look for a mixture of everything. And when you're trying to get the links, you ideally want the links within the content, not the sidebar, not the footer. It needs to be in the content. No one's going to really link to you in the header, but you need in content links because that's editorial, that's acquired, that's not paid, that's what people love, that's what the search engines love. They don't want links you know, from comments and directories that has very little to no value. You also want to look at relevancy. Now I, the reason I say this is optional is the domain itself linking to you doesn't have to be 100% relevant, but ideally the article linking to you on that website has to be relevant. For example, Huffington Post isn't related to Neil Patel because they cover everything, but there's articles on Huffington Post purely about marketing that can link to me, right? And that helps quite a bit. You also want to think about strategy. With strategy, it's all about getting do follow links. You look up your competitors. You want to look to see who links to them and ideally get some of those links because they tend to be the best and most relevant links. If someone's linking to your competitors who are already ranking, go after those links first because you're going to get rankings quicker than if you got random links. So I know you probably have questions at this point, and the main question about link building that people always ask me is, how long does it take to work? Well, from the studies Moz did, they found that it takes at least 10 weeks after you build the link or after it was up for it to kick in. But it realistically takes more than that. You're looking at 20 plus weeks. When a link kicks in for 20 plus links, it really starts helping with rankings. The moment it's less than that, it just doesn't have as much of an effect. And based on your domain authority, it could help quicker, less, but it's all about just building a lot of links, continually doing it, and just being patient. Because if you do, your rankings will go up. It's just a question of time. If you're building it through an agency, you'll start getting results within four to 16 weeks. If you're building it in-house, you can roughly get started within four weeks. If you're you know, building concepts, trying to figure out, hey, what's going to work, or creating like amazing, thorough, cornerstone piece of content, you can usually build links within four weeks. Prospecting, right? You can end up building links through that within four to 12 weeks. And it, when it comes to execution, you're roughly looking at two to four weeks. So if you start combining all of them, you can figure out, all right, here's how long it's going to end up taking, right? Agency, in-house is roughly the same time. 
uh, if you're building concepts, it usually takes four weeks after you have your concepts to start kicking in. And if you're prospecting, you should see results within four to six weeks. And if you're just executing right away and you already know what to do and you're sending emails and getting, you know, doing outreach within two to four weeks, you assume you already have the list and everything, you should start seeing results. There's a lot of mistakes that you also need to avoid with link building. I mentioned some of these, but I can't reinforce them enough. The first one, of course, is too much rich anchor text. If it's too rich in anchor text, it's going to hurt you. You want to have other related keywords that are also your anchors. You don't want to have, you know, uh, anchor text that is just purely related to your industry. You also want random ones like click here or even brand mentions. You need to build the social signals to your site. You shouldn't be buying links because that'll get you penalized. Don't risk it. And of course, you don't want to be exchanging links on a mass scale, but exchanging links here and there to other people within your space and they can drive you traffic and customers, that's okay, but don't do it to manipulate Google. When you're exchanging, you could always no follow those links so that way you won't get penalized. So a few action items for you guys and then we'll take a quick break. Download the link building scorecard, fill it in, make sure you sign up for Ahrefs, and revisit your goal from the first week to understand your why. So shall we take a five minute break, Vignesh? Yes, we shall. Sounds good. So, how old are you now, Vignesh? I just checked. Derek just asked me. I'm 28 years old, and five 28 years old and five hours and 23 minutes or whatever. <laughs> oh man, that's cool. When you come to the US, I have a girl that I want to introduce you to. Her name's Sasha. I already know Sasha. She's fun. She's awesome. Yeah, let me introduce you guys. <laughs> okay, sounds <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. So what's yeah. new, with Jared? You, Jared, it's good seeing you the other day, by the way. Yeah, it was good seeing you too. Are you in uh, Southern California right now? Yeah, I'm in the office still. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah, yeah. What have I been up to? Oh, gosh, going crazy, but I'm pretty excited right now because uh, there's swell in town, so that means that I get to go surf again because the waves have been flat for about a week or two. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. What have you been up to, man? Dude, I've been in the office just grinding, 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then from there I work at home probably for another four or five hours. And then I wake up quite early, so I usually start work technically at 5.30. I don't really – I go into office. I'm there by 7, but I take an Uber, so I'm working in the car, and I start working roughly at 5.30 a.m., so long days. But I, don't I remember that. you said that, and Elena says we need to take Neil out. He needs to have more fun. Yeah, I like working, though. It is fun. I know, but you know what I mean. What are we going to do? That's true. What do you like to do when you go out? Think about work or talk about work. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We do too. We just probably are like drinking wine while we do it. 